the last talk of the day. Are you tired? Yes. I'm exhausted only because it is 5.45 in the morning in the United States where I'm from. Who on earth gives a conference that runs overnight and ends at 6 a.m. in the morning? Uh, apparently, Gids does that, yes? So since you're all tired, you're going to have to indulge me. You are not allowed to ignore this request. I need everyone to stand up, please. Everyone to stand up. It's allowed. In honor of CSS3, I need everyone to jump up and down three times. Here we go. One, two, three. There. You're not nearly as tired as you were before, are you now? Okay, very good. I think this is the perfect talk to end the day with. Because I am assuming that we are all programmers here. Is that a fair statement? Are you programmers? How many of you are programmers here? Very good, very good. How many of you here are graphic designers? Are there any designers here? You're in the distinct minority, aren't you? I'm glad that you're here. I'm very glad that you're here. You can see by all of my books, I am a programmer. I can talk to you about Java development. I can talk to you about Groovy development. I can talk to you about Java script development. So clearly, I am the least qualified person to be standing up here right now telling you how to do design work. But I've given this talk quite a bit. I run the HTML5 Denver user group from Denver, Colorado. And we have the same demographic. We're largely programmers. And we don't appreciate the real power of CSS3. So for this last talk of the day, you're all programmers. I want you to enjoy yourself. Don't sit back because you'll fall asleep. So sit forward and enjoy yourself as we talk about design issues for programmers. I think you'll be impressed with how much CSS allows you to do without writing a single line of code. So what we are going to be doing here is focusing on the capabilities of CSS3. Many of the things we're going to do, you're going to say, well, I've been doing that in JavaScript for years. Absolutely, we all have. We all have our familiar tools that we reach for in the toolbox. And so what I hope you get out of this presentation is not everything is a programming problem. There are lots of things we can do using native browser capabilities. So, I've already asked you if you're a programmer or a designer. And the reason I asked you this is because as programmers, we seem to think that we're doing the important work. We're doing the heavy lifting. We're stonemasons carving statues out of pure rocks of stone. And then it's only after the fact do those graphic designers come in and paint a little bit on the statue, right? They've got the easy work, don't they? I don't believe that for a minute. Do you? No, no, I'm, I'm telling that for humorous effect. But this is our perspective as programmers, that we're doing the important work, and the designers come in after the fact and change a font or a color, but that's all they really do. If you think that, your visual metaphor for CSS are going to be paint brushes. Your visual metaphor are going to be pencils or markers or crayons, something that gets colored in after the fact. Just as I asked you to change your visual metaphor for cookies earlier this morning from delicious treats to rusty old thimbles, I want you to change your mental model of CSS from paintbrushes to blueprints. Because in fact, many times CSS being applied at the end of the project is far too late. If we can apply these elements early, and ha use them pervasively throughout the project, we will be much better off in the long run. Now, certainly when it comes to look and feel issues, fonts and colors and rounded corners, of course, those can be applied any time in the process. Although I'm an independent contractor, and I've discovered a dirty little secret. When I am bidding out work for my clients, the very first thing I do is I download their corporate logo and I put it in the upper left hand corner. 
I look at what their corporate colors are and I incorporate that into my project. I get so much work by using their logo and their colors up front, even when I'm doing wireframes, even when I'm doing preliminary work. That is my dirty little secret. I use even fonts and colors and images before I write a single line of code. But there are other things that are much harder to apply after the fact. Layouts, dealing with headers and footers and left columns and right columns, two column layout, three column layout, these kinds of things. You can apply them late in the project, but it is much better for you to apply them early in the project. And why not establish this before you write a single line of code so it's already in place? The last thing we'll talk about is behavior. And this especially is something that folks who have been solving problems with JavaScript for years said, I had no idea that CSS3 gives you the ability to deal with hover events and transition events, and yes, for mobile devices, even orientation events without writing a single line of code. So I was deadly serious when I said no JavaScript was harmed in the making of this project. All of the things that you're seeing right here are things we are going to do strictly with CSS. Shall we begin? Yes, please. Okay. So I always like giving you resources. I always like giving you books um, that, that you can read for further information. This is an outstanding book, CSS3 for Web Designers. Can you see where I got the inspiration for my title? My talk is called CSS3 for Programmers. Saying CSS3 for Web Designers is like saying understanding semicolons for Java developers. Well, of course, designers understand these kinds of things. But what is very nice as programmers, this is a very accessible book. Are you familiar with the website A List Apart? Alistapart.com. It's a wonderful website. This is by the same folks. It's called A Book Apart. You know what else they offer? They offer software conferences. It's called An Event Apart. You see a pattern forming there. But what I like most about this book is it's not free, but it's very inexpensive. It's uh, $9 US, and you can download it as a PDF. You can read it in an afternoon. It's a very inexpensive resource for you. They have not only books on CSS3, they have books on HTML5, on mobile design, on responsive design, all kinds of things. I encourage you to check out their offerings. But if you like some of the things I'm talking about here, this is a nice resource to take it to the next level. Another resource for you, and because of the time constraints, I'm not going to address many of these issues directly, but I do want to give you SMACS, and that's how it's pronounced, Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. That's way too many syllables. SMACS is what it is. And many times developers are intimately familiar with design patterns. I've been talking about MVC, and we can talk about the visitor pattern and the flyweight pattern and all these kinds of things. Think of this as design patterns for CSS. It will give you a way to give some structure to your CSS, give you patterns that you can emulate that have been proven. Uh, Jonathan Snooks, the author of this, um, was working on very large projects for Yahoo, where it's so large that the Yahoo mail team and the Yahoo address book team are completely separate organizations located in different buildings on Yahoo's campus. And so being able to write CSS in a scalable and modular way for very large applications like this, I found this a very instructive book. This too is a very inexpensive $9 US dollars PDF download that you can download and begin reading in an afternoon. As I mentioned this to programmers, they tend to say, finally, I need some prescriptive advice. I need someone to say, put this file here and name this element this and create this subdirectory. And that's exactly what this book does. Unfortunately, this is the last time you'll see it. So everyone wave goodbye to the book. Okay. It's been nice seeing you. We have three things to cover here. We are going to be talking first about the look and feel issues, the most obvious, the things you'd normally think CSS offers you. So let's dive right in. I'm an HTML developer. I like those elements. I like elements and attributes. That's how I think. And so it's very natural that you might feel inclined to use the font element, 
to use the color element, to use the big element, things like that. But let me appeal to your engineering nature. One of the things that we hold so near and dear to our heart is a clean separation of concerns. If you want to think about web development from an MVC perspective, let me offer this to you. Your HTML should be your model in that it should be a pure document structure without any hints or implication on how it should be displayed. If you think about this for a moment, most of the HTML tags are semantic in nature, not presentational in nature. You might think of H1 being bigger than H2, bigger than H3, but that's really not the point, is it? That's an artifact of how the browser presents it to you. H1 is the top level header in your document. H2 is a subheader. H3 is less than that. The semantics are what are most important. There's no intrinsic presentation information in there. The way your browser presents it to you is your browser has a built-in CSS rule that says, I think H1 should be bigger than H2, should be bigger than H3. You know that you can override that as a programmer, and many times we do. Paragraph tags, anchor tags, divs, spans, all of those are semantic elements not presentational elements. So it makes perfect sense that now in HTML5, all of these presentational tags have been fully deprecated. And it's because it breaks that separation of concern. If we think of HTML as our model, if we think of JavaScript as our controller, what handles behavior, what we're left with is our view, MVC model view controller, and CSS is in fact our view onto the HTML model. Does that make sense? I'm trying to appeal to you as programmers here. You're falling asleep on me, aren't you? This clean separation of concerns is not a new concept. I was really intrigued when this gentleman in 1967 was talking about a clean separation of concerns. He was talking about electronic publishing before they had discovered electricity or certainly before the web had been invented. So this is not a new concept. This is a well-established concept, one that we are carrying forward in modern times. So what this looks like is this. You're going to have a CSS file and an HTML file. Standard disclaimer, in all the examples I'm going to show you, I have my CSS and my HTML in the same document. I feel guilty, I feel dirty every time I present it to you. My argument, my excuse, my alibi is this is a learning rubric. I want you to be able to pull up a single document and see the CSS and HTML in one document. But I would never do this in production and you shouldn't either. Because are you writing a single page web app? Well, if you came to my backbone talk you are, then you can do this. But most of us have multiple web pages in there. And we should be respecting the dry principle. Are you familiar with the dry principle, D-R-Y? Who knows the dry principle? Don't repeat yourself. What is it again? Oh, you just repeated yourself. You aren't supposed to do that. I am so sorry. You're absolutely right. Don't repeat yourself. And what we don't want to do is copy and paste those CSS rules across every single document. If we're in a multi-page website, it makes sense to refactor this information into a single file that can be applied across all pages on our website. There is also an engineering reason for doing this as well. We want to be able to aggressively cache these things. If you copy and pasted those same CSS rules across every page, an unfortunate bit of duplication, but also very large payloads. So what we want to do is factor these into a single document that CSS gets downloaded once and cached on your browser. Every subsequent web page can reuse that information that you already have cached. If you do inline styles or put it in the head of your document, you lose any form of reuse, any form of optimization in trying to be light on the wire. 
So if we've separated those two things out, how can my CSS, my view, refer to HTML nodes or HTML elements in my document? Again, I'm a programmer, and when someone mentioned this to me, and I desperately wish I could remember who did, because I would give them credit. This is brilliant. This is what opened my eyes to the beauty of CSS. CSS is SQL for DOM. DOM, of course, is the document object model. It's the elements inside of my document. So if you think of it like this, select H2 from HTML. Oh, we understand that. That's SQL. I got that all day long, right? Now, we don't truly use SQL. This is a metaphor. This is what the syntax looks like. But now when I look at this, I say, oh, wonderful. What I'm trying to do is apply a set of declarations to my selector. So my selector is select H2, and then my declarations are make it this color and this font size and other things like that. So if you begin thinking of CSS as SQL as a programmer, you say, this isn't so bad after all. I like this. So if I had a selector like that in my CSS, it would select any paragraph in my document. You know that we can apply classes to elements, and we know that we can apply IDs to elements. Help me out. I'm simple-minded, and it's 5 o'clock in the morning. What's the difference between a class and an ID? There's one really important distinction between the two. Blah, 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 blah. You're all right. I couldn't hear any one of you, but you're all clearly right. Yes, IDs are a singleton. I'm using programmer speak here. IDs are a singleton. There can be exactly one ID in the DOM, but there can be multiple classes. So what we have here is the order of specificity going on. Because I can have a paragraph, and I can have a paragraph with a class, and I can have a paragraph with an ID, and you know what? I can even have a paragraph with both an ID and a class. So what I need to know as a program is how do I make this deterministic? You probably were convinced that CSS was black magic, weren't you? that it made no sense whatsoever, there was no rhyme or reason, there was no order to what it is. In fact, it's very orderly. This is the order of specificity. This is the most general element, so this is rules that are going to apply, but if you apply a class, you're getting more specific. These rules will override these rules. An ID is more specific still, so if you have three paragraphs in here, you now know which one will get styled up appropriately. Now, if we had more time, I would wait until you saw these and guessed yourself. I'm going to give you the answer right up front because I'm a nice guy. When we see a paragraph here, we can see that P up top, background color is red. The first paragraph in my document is red. Theoretically, this next paragraph should be red as well, but because I gave it a class of tasty, the tasty rule overrides the more generic paragraph rule. And when I have a third paragraph with an ID of dinner, it's green because my hash dinner, this is for IDs, hash dinner, classes are dot tasty up there, hash dinner is the most specific, my class is less specific, and my generic element selector is the least specific at all. Does that make sense? Yes, very good. Now, what's also important about this is to understand when the cascade kicks in. You notice the cascading style sheets kick in. We have to figure out when the cascade applies. This microphone wants to end up on the floor. So let me show you a live version of this really quickly. As I mentioned, all this information is available up on github.com, G-I-T-H-U-B.com slash Scott Davis 99. That's my Twitter handle and my GitHub handle and wherever I can grab it. So Scott Davis 99 up there. So if we take a look at this selector now, you'll notice all of a sudden this text is blue. So if I come in right now and hit the wrong keystroke and try to email this page to someone, there we go. Now if I come in, there's my email. I'm not going to email this to any of you. I apologize. All right, don't save my email message. But 
Oh, go away, computer. There we go. Now that I am in my doc, in, in my uh, developer tools, and again, I'm in Safari, the same uh, a feature is available to you in Firebug, in Firefox, in Chrome developer tools, I'm sure in Microsoft tools as well. When I'm in here looking at the elements, I can see what CSS rules are being applied. So if I click on my paragraph, and let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that, I can see that my paragraph has a background color of red and a text color of blue. This is my most generic selector that I have. Now, up here, if I come down and look at the next paragraph, I get to see visually in my developer tools that I had an element rule that says background color should be red, but it has been overridden by the more specific tasty class descriptor. But you know what? I didn't override the color declaration. And so that CSS rule cascades to the more specific element. So now what I have is a style rule that's a combination of the most generic paragraph element as long as, uh, uh, along with my more specific class selector. Does that make sense? So cascading is not a bad thing either. It's actually a wonderful thing. It's almost like class inheritance, isn't it? We all know what class inheritance is as a programmer. We happen to call it a cascade in this, but a rose by every other name is just as sweet. So when I look now at my ID, I can see that, yes, indeed, my background color has been overridden by the more specific CSS selector, but the background color is in place. What's also nice about this, I don't know if you see this, these right in here are my user agent style sheet. So in this particular case, I get to see what the default Safari CSS rules are. And if you go poking around in the deep, dark bowels of Safari's executable bits on your hard drive, you can actually open up that CSS file and override it for all websites that you view in that web style. It's pretty cool. All right. So we now understand that CSS is nothing more than SQL for DOMs. And we know that the cascade of cascading style sheets is nothing more than class inheritance. I'm doing everything I can to couch this in programming terms. Are you, are you with me so far? Yes. You're only 20 minutes away from, 25 minutes, 25 minutes away from freedom. So keep your eyes open. Prop them open with toothpicks. Only 25 minutes left. All right, I don't want you to miss any of the good parts. If you like regular expressions, you will love reading the selector spec here. Have you heard the old joke? It is every bit as convoluted and absolutely opaque, unreadable to the general public as regex is. You will love this kind of stuff. Allow me to give you the simplest examples and leave the more complex ones for you late at night when there's no one else around. Just you and your laptop doing regex expressions. All right. We have said that we have element selectors. In this case, I want you to notice what I'm selecting. I'm selecting my input elements. So I have an HTML form in here, and I have an input element, an input element, an input element, and my submit button right here. So this makes perfect sense to you. That doesn't scare anyone at all, does it? That we're setting the width to 15M. Notice what I have in here. This is an attribute selector. It almost looks like XPath, doesn't it? Yeah, programmers say, this isn't bad. I like this stuff. Yeah. So what this means now is I have very general element selectors, and I'm not going to select the submit button based on an ID or a class I assign to it. I'm going to select this particular element based on the type attribute. So in your CSS selectors, anything in square brackets, name value in there, allows you to select elements, excuse me, attributes on your HTML. 
So what this means is I want my submit button to be half as wide as my other elements, and I want its text color to be red. And when we look at how this renders, we can see absolutely it does exactly what we expect it to. Yeah? Now I look at this in another program, I say, yeah, that looks fine, right? And the graphic designers are cringing. They said, that looks awful. Are you kidding me? How can that be okay? Maybe what we want to do is grab those labels and apply a width to them. Remember we applied a width to our input elements. Why not apply that same width to a label? You aren't actually considering putting this in a table, were you? If anyone was, I'm going to have to ask you to leave right now. 1995 is calling. It wants its HTML back. The reason why it's bad, the reason why table layouts are so bad, is we established early on, and you all agreed with me, that these HTML elements must be semantic in nature. Is this a table? No. I want to give you permission to use table elements only when it's tabular data. If it's tabular data, please use table elements because that's exactly what those elements are designed for. If you are using table elements here for the artificial side effect of having all of your labels being the same width, you're doing it wrong. We have CSS rules that allow us to do that. We could select all those labels and just like we did before, we could say width equals 15M. And then you have the same effect, but you're not using a table, you're using CSS styling rules. But I did you one better, and there is no way you could do this with a table. Remember how those labels used to look? They're all on the same line? It's because there are two types of element in HTML. There are block elements, and there are span elements, inline elements technically. Block elements you know because they have an implicit carriage return at the end of them. So think in your mind right now, what are the block elements in HTML? H1, that has an implicit carriage return at the end of it. Paragraph has an implicit carriage return. Div has an implicit carriage return. Those are block level elements. Do anchors have an implicit carriage return? No. Do LIs? Oh yes they do, yeah. But what's very nice about that is there's nothing intrinsic to those elements that dictates how they should be laid out. They are laid out the way because every browser has chosen to apply a consistent user agent CSS style sheet to it. But that doesn't mean you can't break the rules. So notice what I did with label here. I said label is normally a span. We saw that. Label is normally a span. If this was in a table, this and this would always be side by side. You could never adjust it. You could never say, well, for desktop clients, I want them to be this way, but for smartphones, I want them to be this way. And that is crucial for us to be able to control. So what I can do is I can, through CSS, say I want that label to be block style. Now, you certainly weren't going to wrap those labels in B elements and I elements, right? No, you weren't going to do that either. We're going to style that up in CSS so we get this kind of look and feel. Yeah? You should be dancing up and down right now. This is exciting stuff. This is great power especially when you can start selectively applying these rules to smartphones and desktop browsers. Stay tuned, that's what we're going to do next. It's called responsive web design. But let me show you one more thing here. Notice these colons at the end of the label. You aren't going to put those colons in your HTML, were you? Say no. Even if you were, say no, Scott, that sounds like a terrible idea. Right? Because this column name isn't name colon, it's name. The column name in your database isn't email colon, it's email, it's web. So what we can do through CSS is we can use a pseudo element selector. Label 
is a concrete element. It exists in that DOM. I'm writing SQL for DOM to select all my labels and apply that style to it. But a pseudo element inserts a phantom DOM element into the DOM. Excuse me, it inserts a phantom node into, into the DOM. Now, if there's an after, as you can imagine, there's also a before as well. And CSS allows you to select the first child, the last child, the nth child. So if you wanted to zebra stripe your table gray, white, gray, white, gray, white, you weren't going to do that in JavaScript, were you? We would use CSS to select every other element and apply that style, or select the first child or the last style. And in this case, we're going to insert a phantom node, a pseudo node, that contains a colon. And what that means is I can say smartphones get labels on the previous line with a colon at the end of them, desktop browsers, get them side by side, no colon. By dealing with all of this in CSS, instead of your model, or instead of your behavior, you have incredible control over the look and feel. And that's entirely appropriate, because that's what CSS is all about. It's your view. It's for controlling the look and feel. I mentioned the list apart earlier. I love this article because here they're talking about form validation. You say, oh, okay, good, here we go. Form validation, certainly we're going to have to do that in JavaScript, aren't we? No. You're not falling for any of my tricks anymore. You know every time I ask you a question, I'm just going to shoot you down. So what we have now in CSS3 are a bunch of pseudo classes. Now let's be very clear about this. I showed you earlier pseudo elements, inserting phantom nodes into the DOM. What pseudo classes are, are how we can begin representing the state of that element. You're probably familiar with pseudo classes when you're dealing with mouse movements, right? Not mouse over, not mouse, things like that. That's 1995 technology. I'm talking about anchor A colon hover, right? Or A colon visited. That's a pseudo class. That's telling you the state of that link. You're hovering over it right now, or it has been visited on those kinds of things. Well, CSS3 brings a whole host of pseudo classes when it comes to input. So let's pull this apart. I'm going to be selecting all input tags that have the focus, that are required, that are in an invalid state. Think about that. The element that has the focus, the current element I'm in in that form, it has the focus, it's required, and you haven't typed anything in it, I am going to make the background color pink and put a little exclamation point next to it. And if you are in an input field that's required and in a valid state, I'm going to give it a black background. Now, it's one thing to look at it in code. It's another thing to behold in a live demo. Now, again, this code is straight from that List Apart website. So I try to give them full credit. I didn't write a lick of this code. All these other examples I wrote, this one is straight from that article. This is a link to the article, and this is a link to the form. So as I click in a first name field and I begin typing it in, I get a little green checkbox that says, yes, that's valid. When I look over here, come on. Let me shrink you down. There we go. So we can see you and then zoom you and shrink you down, zoom you and shrink you down, zoom you in. All right. We can see that please enter a valid email address is in there. This is not done with JavaScript. This is done with CSS. I am in a field that has email that's in an invalid state. So now it's in a valid state. Please enter your phone number, 1112223333. Not a lick of JavaScript being used to do this. 
all CSS3. Oh my goodness, I have 10 minutes left and four hours of material. So I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, rounded corners are something we can do in CSS. And I mentioned rounded corners not to show you that, oh, isn't this pretty, we can get rounded corners, but to talk a brief moment about vendor extensions to CSS. Now what this means, and this is part of the W3C spec as well, this means as vendors roll out new experimental CSS elements, what they should do is prefix them with an appropriate thing. So Microsoft starts with dash ms, Mozilla dash moz, uh, uh, where are we at, opera dash o, apple dash webkit, so on and so forth. This is a way that all browser manufacturers can say, this is an experimental element. I'm going to allow you to apply this. And this is a fictional element. This text curl doesn't exist. It was invented by the author of this list apart article to demonstrate what they're talking about. Text curl. So as browsers are implementing their own versions, they give vendor prefixes, but this is what the W3C rule will ultimately look like. Now, over time, you can begin pulling those vendor-specific ones out, but the thing you need to recognize is your browser will start reading from the top and read these sequentially. So when Safari only supports the WebKit-specific one, it will read this and stop reading all these other rules. But when Safari gets around to actually implementing the real W3C spec, you don't even need to return that. You should. You should remove it. But if Apple implements the actual spec and not their experimental spec, even if it says WebKit, the browser will say, I'm going to ignore this because I'm no longer experimental, nor am I Mozilla Opera. I am going to use the real CSS style. So this is a very important set of rules that you should remember as well. So that was just the first part of CSS, dealing with look and feel issues. But it wasn't just pretty fonts and colors, was it? We were talking about inserting colons at the end of labels and moving them on a previous line and doing form validation. There is nothing superficial about those kinds of things. And similarly, there's nothing superficial about dealing with layout issues. And in order to understand layout issues, we need to learn how to float. Now, floating strikes the fear into most programmers. They say, I don't have any idea what's going on. It's not nearly as bad as you think it is. Here is my web page right now, and I clearly have rules, header, sidebar, main, and footer, and you can correspond. My main is blue, my sidebar is orange, my header is yellow, and my footer is green. I don't have any problem with this other than that is the worst sidebar ever. It had one rule in life. You were supposed to be on the side, and you're not. And so what we need to do is apply a little bit of CSS styling to get this to work. We would never dream of doing this in a table, would we? Because if we need that sidebar to flip to the other side or flip to the top or disappear altogether, by laying it out in HTML, we've made it model. And it's not a model concern. It's a view concern. The worst thing you could do is lay this out in a table. The best thing you could do is apply CSS rules that allow it to float. Now before we saw if you don't do any floating at all, those things are just going to lay themselves out sequentially in the order you supplied it in the HTML. By floating, what it means is I am going to pick up this sidebar and I'm going to pick it above all my other information and I'm going to float it to the left or I'm going to float it to the right Stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Now, that's what we cheer at football games in the United States. Stand up, sit down. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to float to the left or float to the right. And so what we do here now is we come in and we say, I want my header to be 100% wide. I want my sidebar to be 25% wide and float to the left. I want my main body to be 75% wide and float to the left. That's fine as well. You might be attempted to float one to the left and one to the right. You can do that, but I would recommend against it. I would float everything in one direction, and it's usually left, and use those percentages to dictate how they work. If you float everything in one direction, it's much easier to debug later on. 
The other thing we need to understand with floating is the opposite, which is clear. This is the anti-float. And by setting my header to 100%, I've pretty much guaranteed that nothing is going to sneak in before or after it. But in the spirit of wearing both belt and suspenders, I've said I not only want that width to be 100%, but I want to clear both sides of it. I don't want to allow anything to float to the left. I could say clear left. I don't want anything to end up on the right. I could say clear right, or I can say clear both. So by saying clear both on my header and clear both on my footer, I've guaranteed that they will be alone on that line. And then by floating one 25% and one the other 75%, I've guaranteed those two are going to line up next to each other. Now as a programmer, I look at that and say, that's great. I have a designer who says, that looks awful. You're not going to put this out into production, are you? Uh, no, I guess I wasn't. I only thought I was ready to go into production. I'm very sorry, ma'am. Don't yell at me. So what we need to do is we need to find a way to make the sidebar div as tall as the main div. Now, as a programmer, I would be tempted to force those issues. As a programmer, I'm going to write pseudocode right now off the top of my head. I'm going to figure out how tall the main body is, and then I'm going to turn around and apply that same height to the sidebar. That's entirely wrong. That's entirely wrong. Because we don't want to force the issue. We want to react to this issue intelligently. Notice that these divs right size themselves. Divs in HTML have the wonderful capability of sizing themselves perfectly. If you're into mapping, that's called the minimum bounding rectangle or the bounding box, the B box. And so those divs have a wonderful way of making sure they're the exactly the right size and no larger. So without forcing this by reacting, what do you think I could do? If I want both divs to be the same height, and divs automatically make themselves the appropriate height, what I am going to do is take that sidebar and main and wrap them in an outer div. This div I named wrapper because that's exactly what it's doing. And that div will automatically grow to the longest element in it. But because the one div and the other in there, they're both in place. Notice what I did. I cheated a little bit. I made the wrapper's background color the same color as the sidebar. Now I did that because normally the sidebar is two or three lines long, and the main body is very long uh, as well. So I can turn around and use styling rules to trick the browser into doing the right thing. I didn't have to force anything. I let the browser do what it would normally do anyway. So they talk about this on a list apart as well. And what I like about this article is Jeffrey Zeldman is a wonderful presenter. If you ever get a chance to see him present, please do. He is a joy to watch. But he also is the founder of a list apart. And he talks very frankly about the challenges they had in laying out their own website and talks about his lessons learned using many of these same CSS styles rules. It's a very nice article. Now, I've given you one book called CSS3 for web designers. Here's another book called Responsive Web Design. Responsive Web Design. And what does that look like? I'm going to show you this last example. I'm officially out of time, so I'm going to ask you to stay for this last example right here. If you need to leave, I will allow you to leave. You won't hurt my feelings at all. But for those of you who do want to stay longer, I only have a couple more slides, and I will work my way through those. But I'm going to ask everyone to stay for this final example. This can be the exciting example that you run home and, uh, and, and deal with um, after the fact. So what I love most... And of course, now that I'm trying to hurry, my fingers don't work. Um, did I mention it's 6 o'clock in the morning where I live? Um, so here's the Deconstruct website right now. And what I love most about this website is we are letting the browser 
Do the right thing. All of this is CSS. There is no JavaScript going on here at all. And the reason why this is called responsive web design is because it's responding to the size of the browser. So as my browser gets smaller, I'm going to flip that div. And ultimately, I'm going to end up on something that looks like this. Now, this isn't particularly interesting on the desktop. It's kind of a novelty at best. But what if I view this we website on a smartphone that is this wide? And I view that same website on a desktop browser, and it's wider. And I view it on a smart TV where it's wider still. You aren't really considering setting up an M dot website and a dub 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 website, were you? Because that is the path towards insanity. Because then you have to set up a tablet dot website and a smart TV website. And oh, where well, we're going that we might as well have a Samsung dot website and an LG dot website and a Sony dot website. It's insanity, isn't it? So rather than having a separate mobile and desktop website, if you use these CSS rules, responsive web design, you can serve up the same website to all devices, and it will react to the device constraints. Now, I am a, am I officially out of time? I'm not officially out of time. Oh, yeah, I am officially out of time, aren't I? So this is your opportunity right now to sneak out if you do need to leave. You're not going to hurt my feelings, but if you do want to stay longer, I just have a few more slides, and I would love to have you stay here. Are you all, does anyone need to go? Oh, good. I have you just where I want you. I'm going to keep you here till midnight tonight. <laughs> I'll never let you go. I promise you I won't do that. So what we did on the small with a sidebar div and a main div, when you apply those simple rules to your entire website, you begin seeing the real power of CSS, allowing your CSS to react appropriately rather than forcing those elements. And the way this works is called something a CSS media query. Now, we've had very simple media queries in CSS2 where we could style it up for the screen, and then we could style it up for print. And we could do this both when you're downloading CSS and in your inline CSS rules. Notice this isn't an element selector anymore. This is my element selector. And what I'm doing is I'm wrapping it in what I like calling a meta selector. If you're a meta programmer, you'll appreciate that reference. This is officially a CSS media query. It's saying if you're on screen, make your font size 100%. If you're going to print, make your font size 15 points. This is available in every browser since almost the beginning of time. There's nothing special about this, but with HTML5 browsers, we have a much more sophisticated way. Remember when I said CSS was SQL for the DOM? This is now SQL for your browser window. I can say apply this rule if you're viewing it on screen and your max width is 320 characters. And I can query this, and they're called queries because they are dynamically querying your browser. As I was resizing that browser, the browser was throwing resize events, and the CSS was evaluating that. It was applying the styles that are appropriate for that browser width. Width is a very common one. This is what you'll use for mobile devices and desktop devices. You can use height. You can use orientation to dictate this. I'm doing smart TV development, so I love being able to dictate Aspect ratio. Old standard def TVs are 4 by 3. Modern HD TVs are 16 by 9. So I can begin querying the aspect ratio of that browser window, the resolution, the color depth. Goodness gracious, I can even figure out if you're a progressive scan or interlaced based on querying the device capabilities. Incredibly robust. And most graphic designers, their head, eyes begin to roll their back head. They say, this isn't interesting at all. And as a programmer, I say, this is the best thing ever. I love this. So the last thing we have to talk about, and this will be very brief, I promise you, is 
behavior. We want to deal with hover states, not helicopters, of course. We want to deal with hover states like this. And it's really much more impressive when we see it live and in action. So if I get back, uh, it always slows down the most when you're in a rush. All right. So what I want to be able to do is this. Now, you might think that you would do this in JavaScript. And in fact, in the 20th century, you would do that in JavaScript because that was your only option. But now a much better solution is to do this in CSS. So if we look at what these CSS rules look like, we can see that I have pseudo-selectors again. When I'm hovering over a box, I want it to be blue and the width and height to be this. When I'm not, I want them normally to be that. So again, this is all done through CSS. And if you're a programmer and want a software engineering excuse for using CSS for these instead of JavaScript, JavaScript is an interpreted programming language. Every browser is written in C or C++. This is compiled code. So anytime you're using CSS rules and letting native browser capabilities take over, you will run orders of magnitude faster because you're dealing with compiled code instead of interpreted code. Is that convincing? All right. The only problem with this is it offends my delicate sense of aesthetics. I don't like that snap, snap, snap. What I would much rather have is something, ah, uh, ooh, ah. Uh, yeah, that's the stuff, isn't it? Yes. Of course we're using JavaScript, excuse me, CSS for that. So what we are doing now is we are applying transitions. Remember we had to deal with these vendor prefixes? We didn't have to do that in the last example. Hover states and background colors and sizes, those have all been well established. But this transition state is only available in more modern browsers. So what this means is your browser will start reading this sequentially. If WebKit uses it, it'll apply. But if it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. And you know what? Internet Explorer, IE6, if it doesn't recognize any of these, the worst thing that you will get is you will get the wrong page up. The worst thing that you will get is this behavior. If your browser doesn't understand that CSS declaration, that CSS rule, it will ignore it. It won't throw a segment fault. It won't throw an exception. It won't ab end your session. So when we talk about gracefully degrading, this is the experience you get on IE6. And the best I can offer is, you know what? You're on a 10-year-old browser. You get 10-year-old user experiences. If you upgrade to a modern browser, oh, I could just sit and do this all day. That's just beautiful. That should encourage you to upgrade to a modern browser, that in and of itself. So being able to deal with the hover state, as we saw, was a pseudo class selector. Dealing with transitions requires us to use vendor prefixes because this is new. Come back a year later, all the browsers will have supported that and we will be able to do what we would normally do, just use the W3C transition. The last thing I want to show you, and this really is the last thing, and then you can go, thank you for staying, I really do appreciate that, um, is on mobile devices dealing with orientation events. So, if I were to pull up this orientation, this is what it looks like in my desktop browser. If I were to pull this up in my smartphone, there's my orientation. Notice that they've all lined themselves up vertically instead of horizontally. However, if I flip my iPhone 
on its side. Now I'm getting some horizontal orientation to that. So again, I'm in portrait mode. I'm in landscape mode. I could do this all day as well. I find this incredibly gratifying. But how do we deal with that in terms of CSS rules? How do I get this kind of vertical behavior? The way I do it is by saying, when I'm on the screen and I'm in landscape mode, go ahead and float those list items. Otherwise, let them behave like they normally would, which would be block elements, right? So when I am in portrait mode, let me come back once again. When I am in, oops, wrong browser, here we go. When I'm in portrait mode, I will float those elements, excuse me, I will not float those elements. I will let each one of those list items have the implicit uh, a block style applied. And when I'm in landscape mode, I will float these to the left. Now, I originally thought that these orientation events were really sophisticated. I'm a programmer, so I said, well, clearly what's going on here is you're reading the accelerometer and the gyroscope of the phone and the, the orientation to the moon and the stars and all these things. Do you want to know the difference between portrait and landscape? Are you fatter than you are tall? I'm in landscape mode. So in order to test out these events, you don't need to have your laptop and pick it up and turn around or even have a fancy simulator like this. If you want to test this out, make your browser fatter than it is tall or taller than it is fat, and you have orientation events for free. So we have covered a lot of ground here, and I am only 12 and a half minutes over. I do apologize. I pride myself on keeping the trains running on time. I'm so excited about this. This is 90 minutes worth of material that I'm trying to cram into 45, and I couldn't decide what I wanted to cut out. So since this was the last talk of the day, I kind of figured I'd run late. And I was hoping that you would be as wonderful as you were, indulging me in my extra 12 and a half minutes and not leaving me standing here alone on stage as I told you about orientation events. Thank you so much, not for this, but for the entire day. I really appreciate it. <laughs>